Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Bianca and I are very pleased to welcome this evening Jerome and Wendy, who are extremely experienced researchers and practitioners. Uh, Jerome is a, a, a sports medicine physician as well as a, a researcher, and Wendy is a, another fellow physiotherapist, both of which have done a lot of research on bike fitting and optimizing time trial performance. So I'm going to hand over the, the reins to our colleagues tonight and look forward to learning more about optimizing time trial position and think about the UCI rules and regulations. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to come and chat uh, this evening. Um, so, you know, this uh, time trial fitting is, is really a... a an element of fitting that's that's been under researched and 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 under reported in terms of how uh, to optimize it, and so it's it's a little bit of a black art. So I'm hoping to try and reduce some of the components into more objective uh, parameters that you know everyone can use going forward to try and improve uh, time trial fitting techniques. So, I mean, just by way of introduction, so the, the reason why we have a time trial position is primarily just to reduce the frontal surface area to reduce drag. And that's achieved by rotating, the, the, the primary medium is by rotating the rider over the crank axle and over the handlebar and moving the torso into a more horizontal position. And that's achieved by lowering the handlebar, increasing the, the reach to the handlebar, and obviously the uh, tri-bar extensions, and reducing the saddle setback. So effectively, we're moving from the position that you see in the black stick figure to the position in the red stick figure. So that's really a gross simplification. But uh, effectively, that's what we're trying to do. A very important concept that I think a lot of people um, miss when they do time trial fitting is that there isn't a particular position that's optimal for time trialing. It really depends on the uh, event that the person's participating in, the duration of the event, the power output they can sustain, and, and obviously their average velocity that they're, they're aiming to achieve. And that's because drag increases as an exponential function of velocity. So you have to have a different position depending on the event. So longer duration events, so if you're looking at, for instance, uh, uh, Ironman uh, triathlon, uh, you don't need to have an extremely aero position if you're uh, looking at a midfielder. Uh, obviously, the, the, the winners uh, have got very aerodynamic positions. They're, they're achieving relatively high velocities, uh, almost approaching what we see in uh, UCI men's elite time trials. Uh, so there you're going for a very flat torso position. But a less uh, aggressive position is associated with a better ability to sustain power and also with more comfort. So uh, you've got this sort of, and, and this is just a simplification on this uh, graph, but you've basically got this parabolic relationship with regards to the position of the torso and the, the maximum speed that you can sustain over a specific event. So don't always use a one-size-fits-all philosophy. Um, the position that results in that reduction in frontal surface area does have negative consequences. So when you're doing a time trial fit, you're trying to achieve a optimal drag coefficient while avoiding uh, excess negative effects that could actually re result in a loss of power and a loss of speed. So the one is the reduction in the uh, minimum hip or the, the hip flexion angle. And if you measure that statically, uh, you can go to our methods in our research papers, to exp uh, which explains exactly how we've uh, measured that. But you tend to have a loss of power when your static hip flexion angle uh, gets to less than approximately 71 degrees and also a loss of economy. So Dan Hale um, demonstrated that nicely. Uh, where he showed that moving away from your uh, normal hip flexion angle increases the oxygen cost. And so that's exactly what we see in a time trial position relative to road position. Of course, you can adapt, and there's obviously some adaptation and movement of this curve. But when you get to the extremes, uh, then there's obviously a loss of economy. And then there's also a, a loss of power when you have muscles working in extremes of their length tension relationship. 
So an overly flexed hip, you're going to have the, the gluteal muscles stretched excessively. The hip flexors are in an excessively short position. And so you start to lose power from those muscles. When you rotate the body over the uh, time trial uh, bars, you start to have increased work done by the arms and, uh, and, and the periscapular muscles to support the torso. That can result in fatigue in those muscles and pain. Uh, the anterior rotation of the pelvis results in compression of the anterior area of the perineum, leading to discomfort. Uh, Wendy will show this quite nicely, but when you anteriorly rotate the pelvis, you're also tightening the hamstrings, and that can have deleterious effects that I'll explain in a little bit more detail when we get into the assessment part. And then very much important for the older athlete or for your Ironman athlete that sits in an extended position, obviously not relevant to this talk specifically about UCI time trials, but very extreme positions uh, require excessive uh, cervical extension to look up the road, and that can result in fatigue and pain as well. So those are some of the negative consequences of, of adopting an excessively uh, aerodynamic position, uh, and so we need to try and find balance between that. Before we get into the meat of, of time trial fitting, I think it's important to standardize measurements and to understand exactly what we're referring to. We used to use these measurements for time trial bikes. When everybody used to measure saddle height along the seat tube, you will have noticed both on road frames, particularly on dual suspension mountain bike frames, but also very much on aero frames, that there is no longer a reference frame for this measurement here. And so all the measurements were, other than the measurements for the, for the aero bars, uh, in, uh, such as the, the horizontal top tube length, uh, reach to the handlebars, and obviously saddle height, were measured through what used to be approximately a 74 degree angle. But we've seen some deviation from that. Manufacturers have been measuring to their own C tube angle, which can sometimes be 78, 79, even 80 degrees in, in extreme cases. And that means that some of those measurements are completely invalid. So, what we propose is to use a simple XY reference frame. We do this in our laboratory and we do this for all of our fittings now, whether it's a road bike, mountain bike, or time trial bike. We use a simple XY laser and you can position the XY laser with a vertical component through the crank axle and the horizontal co component in line with the uh, contact point for the initial tuberosities on the saddle. And then you can simply take all measurements in one go uh, without having to resort to a jig or other uh, methods. And so a lot of uh, frame manufacturers are now uh, reporting frame reach as the size of the frame. And that's this number, number one here, which is from this position vertically of the crank axle horizontally through the center of the head tube. And so all of the measurements are relative to that. So if I just go through those, that's frame size, number one. Uh, saddle height, we measure vertically. So it's the vertical component measured from the center of the crank axle to the top of the saddle. Handlebar reach is also from this vertical line to the center of the handlebar. Difficult with um, uh, time trial bars because they're often not uh, coming off the uh, clamping point uh, in a purely lateral direction. Some of them are swept forward um, and that uh, changes that. So it's difficult to know exactly uh, where that, that is. The good news is that it's not that relevant because time trialers spend so little time on the handlebar. Handlebar drop is the vertical distance from the top of the saddle uh, down to the middle of the handlebar. And then very important one is saddle setback. Saddle setback is from the center of the crank axle to the front of the sa uh, saddle, and that acts as a proxy for the effective seat tube angle. The problem with that is you need to standardize for the saddle size. So you get all these very short uh, saddles these days. So this is a, a Physic time trial saddle. It's 240 millimeters in length, but effectively it's like an Arione saddle with the front that's been lopped off. And that's really, they were developed to, to allow people to effectively cheat with, within the UCI regulations. So it allows you to have this five centimeter rule, which we're going to get to later, while still having the saddle effectively further forward. Now you need to make sure that you measure this uh, by correcting for that. So originally saddles used to be 21 and a half centimeters on average from the front of the saddle to the widest point of the saddle where the issue of make uh, contact or the issue tuberosities do. Um, and if you have a shorter saddle, 
And then obviously uh, your measurement in terms of the setback is going to be greater. So subtract whatever value the difference is between 21 and a half and the distance uh, that that saddle is. For instance, a power saddle is 16 and a half centimeters, a specialized power saddle. So you would subtract um, five centimeters from whatever your value that you get here is. So a power saddle that's set up five centimeters behind the bottom bracket would effectively be, with a normal saddle, zero setback. But because it's a short saddle, you have a value of five. So you can use that as your, your value when you're going in to, uh, to have your bike checked uh, when it comes to a UCI race. But make sure that you record the actual setback somewhere so that you can use that as an object of reference frame. Then lastly, uh, there's the horizontal uh, uh, distance from the center of the crank axle to the tip of the extensions. And uh, then there is the drop to the handlebar and the vertical distance from also from the top of the saddle to the center of the elbow pads. And that is um, the drop to pads. Now, if we use those measurements and they're, they're here in the top right uh, for reference, then we can all speak about the same terms. So let's use, try and use standardized terms uh, when, we, when we speak about any aspect of the time trial fit or fitting in general. So that's really just the intro. Before we get into the assessment of um, the uh, time trial fit, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Holliday, Wendy, and she's going to tell you just a little bit more about uh, intrinsic evaluation of athletes prior to fitting them and which uh, aspects are of importance. Perfect. Thanks, Doc. Um, yeah, so if we look at anthropometrics and flexibility and <clears throat> their association with the bicycle configuration, this was part of my PhD thesis, and it's actually currently under review for um, publication, so you're getting a bit of a sneak peek of it. Um, there we go. So what is optimal? And, and everyone likes, all the bike fitters like this, this term of, of optimal. But we're always looking for the guidelines, like what is the optimal guideline? And I think the important thing that we need to consider is that every person who comes in for a bike fit, particularly a time trial bike fit, will need to be assessed on an individual basis. So are they looking for an optimal setup according to performance, according to comfort, or for injury prevention? And your fit is going to be different um, depending on what their needs are. And in a previous study, they looked at um, over 200 cyclists, and it was an online survey, and 90% of them agreed that comfort is a major concern when riding, whereas 46% agreed that comfort is likely achieved at the expense of performance. So you can set somebody up in the absolute um, uh, performance orientated position, but they might not be comfortable or they might actually be in a bad position, which could lead to an, in, to an injury. So we really need to find out from your cyclist who's coming in, what are they looking for in terms of the fit? And another thing that we need to remember is that, particularly with time trial, it's not always lower is better. That used to be the, the thinking that the lower you get, the more optimal you are, the more aerodynamic you are. Um, but the important thing is, can they sustain that position comfortably over the duration of the time trial? Because if they can't sustain that position, then they're going to start losing out on performance. They're going to start performing badly because they're shifting to try and find that comfortable position. And it really is a trade-off that we need to, to come to when it comes to their, to their bike fit. So if we just look at their anthro, um, this is part of the study that we did and we found that um, we, we looked at stature, we looked at leg length, we looked at arm length, all of those <clears throat> things and their association with their freely chosen bike position. Um, none of this has actually been uh, documented before. So we all sort of know it, but it hasn't been published. And we found that the taller the person, the, the more reach that they had on their bicycle, and the taller the person, <clears throat> the more saddle setback that they um, had on their bicycle. If we look at their arm length in particular, we can see that they had more saddle setback 
So this is also linked with height. Obviously, the taller you are, the taller your, um, longer your arms, and the more saddle setback that one has. <clears throat> we also found that the longer the legs, so um, the more setback that they had on their bike. So these are all just associations that we found with freely chosen bicycle configuration. Linked with the leg length was that um, the longer the legs, the higher their saddle height. Now, we know this. This is all linked with previous research that looked at trochanteric leg um, height, that looked at inseam length, and tried to find optimal with that. So the longer the legs, the higher the saddle. We also found that the longer the legs, the more handlebar drop that they had. Um, all significant findings that, that haven't actually been published previously. And if we look at flexibility, um, so we know that your hamstrings are biarticular muscles and that they originate from the pelvis and they cross over the knee and they're in a stretched position when the hip is flexed and the knee starts to extend. And that's <clears throat> typical of a, a position that you find during the pedal revolution. So what do we need? What does that imply with our bicycle configuration? Well, we found with all these 50 cyclists, that <clears throat> the more hamstring flexibility they had, there was an association with more handlebar drop. So this means that closer to 90 means that they were able to straighten their leg more, which means they had more hamstring flexibility. And with that, they were able to have their handlebars in a lower position. And we'll, we'll come around to that just now, but just keep that in mind. We also found that more hamstring flexibility was related to um, an increase in PPO and VO2 max results. So it's not a cause, but there's an association. The more hamstring flexibility, the higher their PPO and VO2 max results. <clears throat> we also found that the more handlebar drop position they had, the higher their PPO results were. And if we try and bring that all together, so all those graphs can get a little bit complicated, but if we bring it together, if we think of those hamstrings, the greater your hamstring flexibility it is, is a greater handlebar drop position. And that's because if your hamstrings are tight, it's going to have to pull on one of the structures. Either your pelvis has to rotate more posteriorly to allow the hamstrings, um, because they not they don't have that stretch, or your knee has to bend. Now, when you're sitting on your saddle and your foot is clipped into your pedal, as you're pedaling, you need to extend that knee, which means that that stretch needs to come from somewhere. And if you don't have that flexibility, your pelvis is going to start rotating posteriorly. You're either going to slide off of the saddle as your foot touches bottom dead center because you've clipped in and you're going to start rotating more posteriorly um, with that pelvis if you don't have that hamstring flexibility. So a greater hamstring flexibility we found was associated with a greater handlebar drop. So as your flexibility increases you have that ability to rotate forwards and get an anterior rotated pelvis which allows you to have your handlebars lower down, okay? An anterior rotated pelvis um, is then increased with, is associated with that increased handlebar drop. So if you rotate forwards, you can reach further and further forwards and lower down. The greater hamstring flexibility is also associated with an increase or greater PPO and VO2 max results. And a greater handlebar drop is associated with an increase in PPO. So it all comes together with that, with that hamstring flexibility, allowing that rotation of the pelvis, which allows you to get into a better position on your bike. And um, so just some, some results that are coming out in, in a study, hopefully soon. All right, back to you, Doc. Thanks, Wendy. Sorry, I was just unmuting, unmuting myself. So, uh, great little bit of insight into what helps somebody achieve a good time trial position. 
And the take home message obviously there is greater hamstring flexibility is important to become more aero and still uh, be able to function properly and obviously produce good power. So how do we get to a good aerodynamic time trial position? Let's start at the beginning. And effectively, let's start with the frame size. So time trial frame size, if you're using doing this for a UCI uh, specific race, you'll typically have a saddle setback of five centimeters. If you're using a very short saddle, then obviously effectively the saddle is a little bit further forward. So your time trial frame size in terms of the frame reach should be similar to your road bike uh, size or greater. So if you've got a, uh, a position where the, in, in, in absolute terms, the setback is less than five centimeters, then uh, you're going to be further forward compared to your road bike. And so a low frame size uh, is, is uh, the one that you want. And so that's obviously, there's no absolute there, that's all relative. The very aggressive time trial positions, you need about a five centimeter longer top tube. Uh, and, and, and if you're going for a less aggressive position, then closer to your road bike in terms of norm, uh, that top tube. If you want to just get an, uh, a position for the initial fit for the saddle, refer back to the road uh, saddle position. And for every um, centimeter that you bring the saddle forward, rate uh, by a millimeter. Obviously, that changes, uh, so it's not always the same ratio. It depends on where you are in that sort of arc of rotation, but that's just a rough guide. Uh, so, for instance, raise it three and a half millimeters if you bring the saddle, say, three centimeters further forward compared to road position. Then we assess the knee, hip, and shoulder angles using static kinematics while in the aero bars, and I'll go through that in, in a little bit more detail. Why use static kinematics? We were just talking to uh, Tim and, and, and Ben about this before the, the talk, and that is because when it comes to dynamic kinematics, we don't have uh, much data to refer to. The study that Wendy was talking to you about now that's currently in review actually publishes uh, static joint angles for those three joints for a, uh, a set of 50 individuals for normal uh, road bike position but there aren't similar reference values for dynamic kinematics. So we tend to start with static kinematics and then we work into the more dynamic measurements when we use specific features of that, which I'll get to in a second. What is good to record is that as part of this, we use a, a digital inclinometer to take these measurements and record the pelvic angle at the sacrum and lower spine. So this is the digital tool that we use. And that's quite a useful one in terms of the time trial position because it gives you a good indication of what's happening with that pelvis. So Wendy was talking about anterior pelvic rotation with the hamstrings uh, pulling back against that when you've got tight hamstrings. And in the time trial position, that's one of the things that's ability to anteriorly rotate the pelvis and get into an aerodynamic position uh, is that hamstring flexibility. So when we start uh, fitting the person in the initial position, we'll measure this pelvic angle and typically that in a, in a time proposition ranges, in my experience, anywhere from 41 degrees up to 55 degrees, depending on the position that you've achieved. But that gives you just an idea of the range that you can be in. Then before we do anything else, we look at saddle pressure mapping. And I think for, from a time trial fitting perspective, saddle pressure mapping gives you the greatest wealth of information about whether that position is effective. And I'll show you some examples in a second. So this is a kind of example that we typically see when we first put somebody who's already got a time trial bike into the studio and we start fitting them. We typically see that uh, their position is almost always too aggressive and that they're sitting right on the front of their saddle. So they have this high pressure point on the front of the saddle and they have this center of pressure. So the black line, for those of you aren't familiar, is the movement of the center of pressure. And it has this sort of erratic pattern that has no reproducibility. And that's a sign of a bad time trial fit, an unstable position. This person is compensating excessively for various different features. So what we do is uh, we want to get the pelvis to engage with the saddle. So if you look at the, the pelvis from underneath, 
when you're sitting on your chair, just like you are now, you're sitting on your ischial tuberosities, which also happen to be the attachment point for the hamstrings. But when you're sitting on a road bike saddle and more importantly on a time trial saddle, you rotate anterior and the ischial rami are where you actually end up uh, sitting on the ischial rami and pubic rami. And so if you look at the saddle from the lateral aspect, I mean the, the pelvis, when you're in a time trial position, you're rotating anteriorly and you're starting to engage more with the front of the pelvis where those ischial rami narrow down and are angled inwards uh, in this sort of fashion. And this is sort of where your contact point is with the saddle. So you want to try and create a good contact point with the saddle. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is your typical road pressure mapping where your center of pressure is quite far back. And most of the pressure is, uh, is on the rear part of the saddle. Good time trial position, a good time trial fitting. Sorry, I, I tried to find a really good example, uh, but this is, uh, I need to go through all of our data to find one that's really good. But this is your typical time trial uh, uh, pressure mapping when you've got uh, a good stable fit. Uh, the reason why this, and, and those of you who do pressure mapping, why this uh, center of pressure is moving so much is that we standardize saddle pressure mapping always to a particular power output. And since we measure static, I mean, dynamic kinematics at functional threshold power, we do the same with saddle pressure mapping. So there's more movement than you would normally experience in a, in a, at a lower in, uh, power output. But what you do want to see is that the center of pressure makes this very nice reproducible pattern. On a road bike position, I'll go back one, you get this on, on its side figure of eight, um, whereas in a time trial position, that gets turned into more of an arrow-like uh, shape. And you get this reproducible arrow-like uh, movement pattern. And that's a sign that the person is following the same movement with each pedal stroke and is stable um, on the saddle. You, we, tend to use because they've anteriorly rotated uh, you need a saddle where the support of the saddle is on the front of the saddle in those areas of, of contact and that typically means also a wider front of the saddle to support the pressure over the pubic area over a greater surface area to reduce uh, the the pressure in any given at any given point so this is your typical time trial saddle position so what we do is now, uh, when once we've looked at those static angles and we're happy that they're within a normal range, and so by that I mean obviously we use a, a, um, Holmes method for the static knee flexion angle. We want that to be tw between 25 and 35 degrees. We look at the hip flexion angle at top dead center. And we try to get that into a, a range of somewhere between 69 and 74 degrees, which is less than we'd see for road bikes. We know from our experience that once you get this angle below 69 degrees, it invariably results in an unstable position. So we typically see about 69 to 74 degrees. And you can refer to our research where the methods are quite clearly um, illustrated and to how we measure those, those angles in terms of the anatomical landmarks. Um, and then once you've got that knee flexion angle and hip flexion angle within the range, you can raise or lower the pads or alter the saddle setback to achieve an acceptable hip flexion angle. So if this angle is too acute, so for instance, you're sitting at 66 degrees or 67 degrees, you can move the saddle forward. We'll get to the UCI regulations later on, but once you get to a minimum saddle setback, then you've got to raise the aero bars to try and get that hip angle open to a minimum of 69 degrees sometimes more if you're going for a much longer duration time trial, but that doesn't really have relevance for UCI time trials. And then look at the shoulder flexion, which we measure from the upper thoracic spine through and through the humerus. And we correct the shoulder flexion by changing the reach to the extensions and obviously moving the um, elbow pad fore and aft. Once we're happy with that, the gross uh, uh, static joint angles are acceptable, then the next thing we do is do a dynamic knee flexion angle at functional threshold power. So we use uh, Kynovia or STT to do our uh, dynamic kinematics, so either 2D or 3D kinematics. We know from uh, Wendy's uh, research for a thesis uh, that compared to the Holmes method, you're going to have a, a greater range. And at functional threshold power, 
it's approximately five degrees difference between a static measurement. So you're looking at a range between 30 and 40 degrees and very much dependent on hamstring flexibility in a time trial position. So just to give you an example, so here's a uh, top uh, Ironman athlete who I coach, Matt Troutman, who's won uh, numerous Ironman events, and uh, he has a limitation in his hamstring flexibility, which we're working on. So this is him uh, uh, in, in our lab. And you can see that dynamically, he's only able to uh, reach a minimum knee flexion angle of 35 degrees. And the obvious compensation for that when he gets to the, the, the maximum uh, in terms of his hamstring flexibility is that he ends up uh, plantar flexing the ankle to compensate. And as Wendy pointed out, you start to get posterior rotation of the pelvis because you cannot accommodate uh, for that hamstring tightness. The other way that you end up compensating is that you shift forward on the saddle to reduce effectively the distance between the saddle and the, the crank. So by moving forward on the saddle, you, you can shorten the distance a little bit and basically reduce the, the tension on the hamstrings. And that's why it's so important to have the saddle pressure mapping to refer back to. So someone with tight hamstrings in a time trial position, you're not going to see less than 35 degrees knee flexion angle dynamically before they start to compensate in either posterior rotating the pelvis and you'll get a bit of a kyphotic shape to the back or you'll start to see excessive ankle plantar flexion or both. Or on the saddle pressure mapping, you'll see that they end up too far forward on the saddle. So lower the saddle until you see that they've got, so someone who, until they have a knee flexion angle that is uh, appropriate for their hamstring flexibility. Someone who can do a knee extension angle of 90 degrees may well reach a knee flexion angle of 30 degrees dynamically without compensating. So once you start to see compensation by excess of ankle plantar flexion or abnormal saddle pressure mapping, you know that you've reached your maximum saddle height that you can achieve given the athlete's intrinsic characteristics. <clears throat> this is just from, from Wendy's research, why we see a five degree greater knee flexion angle than static. And at um, FTP power, um, which is approximately here, we see about a five degree difference compared to the static angle. Unlike your normal road bike position, when you change the position of the aero bars, you have quite an influence on your dynamic knee flexion angle. So don't just adjust the saddle. If you're not achieving the correct knee flexion angle dynamically with changes in the saddle height, it's probably because they are in a excessively aerodynamic position that they can't accommodate for and they'll probably end up sliding forward on the saddle and uh, and that's why they're going to have a reduced knee flexion angle so if you don't if you aren't able with raising the saddle to reduce the knee flexion angle and they're not compensating elsewhere it's probably because of the aero bar position so remember that that influences it and sometimes you need to first reduce the uh, um, these I would use the term severity of the position or the excessiveness of the position to be able to get a good uh, dynamic knee flexion angle. So that's where we want to start is with getting the, the, the knee flexion angle correct. Then look at your saddle pressure mapping again and then start correcting the aero bar position until you reach a stable position. So there's a lot of fiddling involved in it. It's not as simple a one, two, three type process. But I would start by getting the pelvis in the right position and getting the knee flexion ankle correct and then start uh, getting the aero bar position in the correct position. So this is the example that we started with uh, earlier on. And when you start to, for instance, raise the aero bar or reduce the, the reach to the extensions, if the, if the shoulder flexion angle is excessive, then you start to see them move more onto the saddle and engage with the saddle. This is sort of an interim position where you can see now there's engagement with the saddle, but if you look at that center of pressure, you still see a lot of uh, uh, movement of that center of pressure in a, in, in a, in a very uh, unpredictable fashion, and that's a sign that they're still compensating excessively. And then by doing simple adjustments, for instance, raising the, the elbow or the aero bar or the elbow pads uh, another centimeter, then suddenly you get this uh, picture. And that tells you that you've now achieved a position that's stable 
and that the, the individual is not compensating some way for, and that is their achievable aerodynamic position. So you can obviously change that position to a more aerodynamic position if they're able to increase their hamstring flexibility or their strength in terms of their um, various muscle groups that aid in stability in the time trial position. But you have to obviously work on those intrinsic factors and then reassess that position at a later stage. So once you've done the handlebar position, I would always say go back to your dynamic knee flexion angle and your um, um, and your pressure mapping, because as you start to engage more with the saddle, you're moving into a more posterior position on the saddle, and that may then obviously increase your ex your knee extension, and that can then result in compensatory changes again. So if you're unable to reach a stable position on your saddle pressure mapping, it's probably because as they you've moved the bar up, the person's moving backwards, and now their knee flexion angle is. Uh, uh, um, too low to, or they may maintain the same knee flexion angle, but compensate excessively elsewhere. So always go and check that again. So you go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until you get a um, good position. When you get a position that you think is good, take those aero bars and raise them a good couple of centimeters. And the reason why you do that is because if you look at all of the time trial positions that we see these days, I'm going to get to some pictures now so that I can actually show you what I'm talking about. But you'll see that uh, the riders have very, very flat torsos. And the way that they actually achieve that is by scapular retraction or the shoulder shrugging. And that reduces your frontal surface area quite dramatically by bringing your shoulders closer together. But to be able to do that, you need to have a very high aero bar position so that you can retract the shoulders, which then move around the thoracic cage and move higher. In other words, forcing your torso lower and causing your pelvis to anteriorly rotate if you don't have uh, high bars. And so what we want to see in a good time trial position is a flat and aerodynamic torso position. You want to have the saddle height optimal so you don't want to see compensation uh, happening at any point, and you want to see a knee flexion angle dynamically that is in keeping with those, that person's intrinsic factors, and you want it to be stable. So they should be engaging with the saddle enough to give them decent support. Their joints should be operating within an optimal range, and those contact points should be optimized to support that body. So if you look at a good position here, Stade, and you'll see that most of the, the top time triathletes have a very similar look to them. There's this very flat torso. And you can see to achieve that, we have quite a number of spaces now under the aero bars to bring the elbows up high enough so that they can retract the shoulders, so your scapular retraction, to narrow down the frontal surface area from the front. And Tade looks very, very similar so, to many others. So that's a good time trial position. Uh, Primoz Roglic is obviously also a very good example. Once again, lots of spaces to bring the aero bar higher so that you can retract the shoulders and do that shoulder shrug, bringing the torso into a very flat position, still engaging with the saddle, and obviously dynamically having a normal knee flexion angle so that you get optimal power production and economy. So that's also a good position. Uh, Felipe Garner, <coughs> also same story once again. Lots of uh, uh, height to the bars, bringing them into a high position where you've got retracted scapulae, flat torso, and still good engagement with the saddle. What you don't want to see is this sort of position. So not every World Tour team uh, has fitted everybody perfectly to their bike. And so this is uh, Jonathan Castellareo. And here you can see scapular protraction around the torso excessively. The torso is not flat. You're now sloping down towards the front of the bike. And obviously, that's not a position that's stable or comfortable. And so he slid all the way forward to compensate. And also, if you look at his knee extension, it's quite uh, a minimal uh, knee flexion. So if he had to sit right on the back of the saddle, he'd be excessively straight with his knees, so unable to achieve that. So all of these contact points need to be changed to be able to achieve a position. So that's a no-no position, so you can get the idea of which features we're looking for 
and how we get there with various different techniques I've outlined. If you get a good time trial position, so here's Primos again, here's Matt after he stretched his hamstrings, and you can see now he's able to anteriorly rotate his pelvis further, and his torso is actually flatter with less kyphosis uh, than before. Position is the same, just working on those intrinsic factors, and when you have a really good time trial position, you can see that they're pretty much always superimposable. So here the wheels are superimposed, and you can see the torso is almost in exactly the same position. The only difference is the arms. Uh, Primos is limited by the UCI regulations. Matt with, with uh, his hands are in a higher position with a greater angle. Uh, but everything else, other than the legs, obviously, which are at a different point in the pit stroke, is in exactly the same position. And you'll see pretty much the same position for all the top time trial guys uh, because they're working on those same concepts that I've outlined in the previous slides. So now I'm going to hand over back to Wendy again, who's going to chat to you about some of the exercises that are important in, in achieving uh, a good position like that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we really need to start strengthening that time trial position. You know, we do the bike fit, and it doesn't mean that you can suddenly hold that position for the length of a time trial. And um, we really need to strengthen that position. And I talk about strengthening the endurance of the position. So a majority of your riders will argue with you when you tell them that they need to go to gym and do some strengthening work. And it's because they don't want to bulk up. They don't want to get big. They don't want to do weights. They don't want to become heavy. Um, but they need to be as light as possible. And a lot of these exercises aren't about getting bigger muscles, but more about strengthening that position, that position that you're holding yourself in, particularly in a time trial position. And I talk about the endurance of that position. So you need strong muscles to hold you in that position so that you're not shifting and that you're not uncomfortable during your time trial. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the, the basic exercises that I do and some of the pro the progressions that I give the riders for the time trial um, position. So the, one of the most basic ones is just on your hands and knees. And this is an easy one to do after your ride. Um, you don't have to do it on a plinth. You can do it on the floor. But what you do is you get yourself onto your hands and your knees. You make sure that your pelvis is in a good position so that you're not rotating posteriorly. Your hands are beneath your shoulders and you're in a good shoulder position. And you just lift one arm and then bring it back down and you lift the other arm and bring it back down. Now, the important thing with this is there's no point in doing this if you're going to drop or start rotating through the body. You need to be able to do this really well. It's a slow exercise. If you can only do one or two of them, that's perfect. We want you to get that shoulder girdle strength, your neck strength, and then the pelvis strength. And you can see here, there's just a progression of doing opposite arm and leg and then bringing it back um, down. So really about just that coordination of getting that pelvis into a good position, getting that flat back and getting the shoulder girdle support and not dropping through the neck, making sure that the neck and the chin are in a good position um, whilst you're doing that. And then just strengthening that position. So that's a nice easy one. It's one of the first ones that I give riders um, <clears throat> and then I cue them so that they can do it on their own. So they don't have to have somebody watching them. They can tell when they start dropping or when they start rotating. So spending a lot of time with the rider, just making sure that they know when they're doing it right and when they're starting to weaken and start doing it wrong, because I don't want them to strengthen a bad pattern. As I say, I'd rather that they only did two or three of these exercises correctly than 10 of them really badly, because then you're just strengthening that bad pattern. So that's one of the first exercises that I give them. Um, you can progress this into a plank. So I usually give the, the riders with the straight arms. Time trial, you obviously want them um, in that bent elbow position. And you can start this one off on the floor. It doesn't have to be on a bozu ball. What I would recommend is that you start them on the floor and you make sure that they get that nice lengthened position so that they're not arching through the back, they're not dropping through the chin, 
their shoulders are retracted and they're getting a nice shoulder girdle strengthening position and then progressing it onto the bozu ball. I couldn't find a picture, but what I'd recommend is actually turning that bozu ball the other way around. Here, what I find is that you just sink into the ball, whereas if you turn it so that the dome is underneath and then put a towel down um, and then rest your forearms on the flat surface, you're really having to work quite hard in keeping your shoulder girdle nice and supported, keeping your chin in a good position, and keeping that upper body nice and long. Same thing, it's not about holding it for a minute. It's if you can hold it correctly for 10 seconds before starting to shift and poke the chin out or lift up through the buttocks, then we stop. It's really about doing this exercise correctly, and eventually you'll get to a minute. So... Progression from the floor, maybe onto a bozu ball, but just the other way around. And you can do it with straight arms or you can do it um, more time trial focused um, on your forearms. If we want to take that a step further and just shift that, that stability part. So um, the previous exercise, you were unstable underneath your shoulder girdle. Now, if we use your TRX straps, you're going to be unstable at your feet and that's a longer lever which means that you really have to engage the full body into this exercise so the core has to work and the glutes are have, having to work shoulder girdle and your neck a really nice full body exercise same thing you can do this um, with your elbows straight so on on your hands or you can go into an elbow position so resting on your forearms which is a really nice um exercise for the for the time trial position um, a lot of these exercises just have the shoulders in a in a good position if you want to you can start practicing that shoulder shrug position and adapting it for the time trial position um, with that this is quite an advanced exercise I definitely wouldn't jump to this straight away um, depending on the level of rider that's with me because what I'm going to see is they're going to do it badly and, and then there's no point in them doing the exercise. So i rather take them all the way back to the beginning and then get them strong enough to start with this position. Another thing that I start doing here, you can see her hands are flat. Depending on what time trial bars they've got and where their hands are going to be, it's going to change the muscles that support your scapula. So if you have your hands flat versus rotated, you can see what happens to your shoulders. So what I would do with the rider is change their hand position so that it mimics where they are on their time trial bar. So depending on which bars they've got and getting them maybe to do a plank in that position, which is similar to their bars, as opposed to flat, which is going to change their scapular position. So really just customizing the exercise for the rider and the type of bars or equipment that they've got. As I say, a very advanced one. If you want to take it even further, which your elite cyclists should be able to do, is your mountain climbers. So you can do this on the floor or you can do this in your TRX straps, a really, really advanced exercise. Um, getting them into that plank position, one foot in each of the straps, and then mimicking that cycling action of bringing the feet up and down. It's not about how many times they move their legs, but can they keep their neck in a good position? Can they keep their shoulders in a good position? Can they keep that flat um, thoracic area and the pelvis as well? And you'll see with this video, she's keeping nice and strong at the top and she's doing it nice and slowly. It's not about how fast you do that exercise. It's about keeping it nice and slow and control through the exercise. Um, as I say, a really advanced exercise, but one that is a nice one if you are an elite, if you're working with elite cyclists to give them. If their wrists start getting sore, you can just place a towel underneath um, just to soften that wrist angle, um, angle onto the floor. Or you can put um, a box down, one of those um, benches, and get them to do this with their elbows on the bench, which also mimics more of the time trial position. And it's a really great functional exercise, bringing in 
all the components um, of the body for this exercise. Another one that I give them, and, and this is one of these that they all look at and they think, oh, it's so easy, um, but it's actually a very difficult exercise. Start without weights or the little 1 kg weights or even a 500 gram weight in each hand. And you get them to lie straight over the ball. Obviously, the higher up the ball, it is easier. So their neck doesn't have to work as hard. And then as you bring the ball down towards their stomach, obviously, the lever hanging over the ball is longer and there's more weight. So they have to work harder. So start with the ball high up underneath the sternum or just below the sternum. With little weights in your hand, make sure that their body is nice and straight, that their neck isn't poking out. And then ask them to do a T. So the arms make the crossbar of the T, go into a Y, go into an I, and then a W, and back out to a T. And that really works all the thoracic extensors, the cervical extensors, whilst just giving your scapula a little bit of movement as you go from the T to the Y to the I and then back down. And you would progress that by just getting them to shift more and more forwards on the ball. Same thing, what you want here is that they're able to hold that position. So you can see with this, you're using no weights or very light weights. They're not going to bulk up with this, but they really are going to get those neck muscles working, the shoulder muscles working, and then the thoracic and lumbar extensors working in order to hold that position on the bike. So another nice exercise for them to do, another nice easy exercise if they don't have the TRX straps um, available to work with. And then the all-important hamstring stretch. Now, everyone says, you know, how, how do we stretch the hamstrings? And I see so many people doing a hamstring stretch, but the hamstrings aren't doing any stretching whatsoever. The neck is stretching or the arms are stretching um, or the back is stretching. So just to give you an example of how I teach the, the hamstring stretch is I get them to, to put their foot up either on a chair or on a bench, even a step will work. And you can see here, she's in a really bad position and she can barely touch her toes. But as soon as I correct her, so as soon as I get her to get that post that sorry anterior pelvic tilt you can see how much further she goes and she suddenly feels that stretch in the hamstrings you get the thoracic position sorted and you get their neck position sorted and there you can really feel the stretch in the hamstring so you're isolating it to the hamstrings one of the reasons why i like this stretch is you can get the upper body in a position that they would be on the bike. So you, you get their thoracic area, um, thoracic spine, you get their neck in a good position, you rotate the pelvis to mimic their position on the bike, and then you would feel that stretch even more into the hamstrings. So it really becomes something that is functional, something that they can then cross over onto the bike because you're stretching them in the position that they would be on a bike which is much better than lying on the floor and taking a towel and pulling on your foot and trying to get your leg as high up as possible. That's not how we sit on the bike. So this one, really get them, and it, it's really about cueing them because they do try and cheat. It's not nice to stretch hamstrings if they're tight, but get their upper body into a position that they would be on the bike, rotate that pelvis, and that's where you really start feeling the stretch. Um, when people reach for their toes, they're actually just stretching the thoracic or their lumbar spine. They're not stretching that hamstring. But as soon as we start rotating that pelvis, we get a really good stretch into those hamstrings. And, and that is a really nice stretch for your rider to be able to do. With all of these um, exercises, it's as I said, it's not about um, bulking up. It's not about heavy weights. And it's not about doing 50 repetitions. It's about the control of the exercise and the quality of the exercise. And you really want them to be able to do it properly. And if that means only doing one or two of them to start with, then that's what you do. And you slowly progress them um, into more advanced exercises or for more repetitions or for holding it for longer.
I think one of the, the best things that your riders can do, because they don't always want to do exercises, they don't want to go to gym, um, particularly in times now, is if they're doing indoor training, is just get them to hold that position, that time trial position, so that shoulder shrug, get them down into the time trial bars for their warm down. Or during their cycle, during their ride, get them down and train in that position just for a few minutes at a time so that their body starts getting used to that shoulder shrug position and holding it there um, so that they don't start shifting. As I say, it's about strengthening that endurance of the position. All right. Thanks, Pleasure. Wendy. Right. Uh, so moving into the last section of the talk, I'm just going to talk about the UCI regulations and some of the fitting factors that, that uh, you should take into account. So some of the, I'm not going to, the, the UCI regulations are extensive and they, they uh, cover everything from the, to the shape of the, the tubes and various other factors. So these are just the ones that are important in terms of the fitting side of things. Uh, in terms of the saddle, there has to be a minimum saddle length of 240 millimeters. That saddle that I showed you earlier, the physic one, I mean, this is a very short saddle, yet it's 240 mils. It's obviously because it's got a long rear part. So other saddles make sure that they are at least 240 millimeters. Otherwise, they're not UCI legal. Maximum length is 300 millimeters. They used to um, have to have the saddle flat, but they relaxed those rules a few years ago, and you can have a maximum saddle tilt of nine degrees. That is through the... the, the uh, basically, you need to put a flat object on the saddle. And so any contact points between the contact points uh, on the saddle, anywhere between that flat object and the saddle, the maximum angle that it can uh, be at is nine degrees to the horizontal. So that's the, 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 the saddle tilt side of things. Um, you have to have a minimum of five centimeters of saddle setback. So actually measured saddle setback, not the effective saddle setback the actual measured distance, and the maximum distance to the handlebar extensions needs to be 75 centimeters or less to the tip of the shifter. I'll get into a little bit more detail about that in a, in a second. However, so just before I, I, I talk about however, we're talking about these two values. So this has to be a minimum of five centimeters, and this has to be a maximum, can be a maximum of 75 centimeters. So those are, that's the, 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 those are the key rules. You are allowed a deviation from that, so what they call a morphological exemption, to a minimum of zero setback. So you can move the saddle, the front of the saddle, right into the vertical line uh, going through the crank axis, or you can have a maximum of 80 centimeters to the handlebar extensions or if the rider is 190 centimeters in stature or greater, you can increase that to 85 centimeters maximum. But you're only allowed one of these exemptions at a time. So you can either move the saddle forward, then you have to keep the, the, the reach to the extensions at 75 centimeters or less, or you leave the saddle at five centimeters and then you can go up to 80 or up to 85 centimeters to the reach for the extensions. In my experience, when you've got a rider with, and because of the difference in segments between, you know, torso length and leg length and arm length, and also because of differences in flexibility, there's no absolute value that uh, you can use. But generally, riders who are uh, of 175 centimeter stature or less tend to do best with using this exemption, so moving the saddle further forward and keeping the extensions at 75 centimeters. But riders that are greater than 180 centimeters tall, we tend to have the saddle at about five centimeters setback and then start to move the extensions um, further. Obviously, there's within that range, there's a, a, a variation depending on the individual characteristics of the athlete the, uh, and, and their flexibility and so forth. So that's in terms of those two rules. In terms of the cockpit, so the aero bar, the elbow pads have to, uh, can only be a maximum of 12 and a half centimeters wide and also 12 and a half centimeters in length, not more than that. 
the error bars in any cross section, so vertical or horizontal cross section, the maximum diameter is 40 millimeters, never in excess of that. And in terms of the angle of the error bars, this has been limited to a 15 degree angle. That's because in, in the early uh, uh, days before they implemented this rule, uh, riders were experimenting with lifting the hands very high, so putting the hands in front of the face, and that uh, putting you in a very aerodynamic position by allowing the arms to break the airflow and then it uh, going around the, the head and torso uh, and, and, and creating a very aerodynamic position. But the UCI was worried that that would be um, unstable and dangerous, and so they've limited it to 15 degrees for the, for the aero bars. Also, the height difference between the center of the pad so the center of the elbow pad here and the highest point or lowest point of these extensions cannot exceed 10 centimeters. So here's a couple of examples. This is the first one. So this is the reach to the end of the extensions. So if I just go back a few slides, we're talking about this value here, okay? And the rule is not more than 75 centimeters, but if you choose a morphological exemption, you can go up to 80. And if you're more than 190 centimeters tall, you can go up to 85. Now, it makes sense to use an electronic shifting system because then you have the cleanest uh, shifter because the UCI measures to the end of the shift lever. So if you've got a shift lever that um, uh, centers automatically to this position or this position, then you're actually losing out on a few centimeters that you could be uh, using if you had a uh, electronic a shifting system where the buttons are part of the, the area that you hold on to. So um, uh, if, you're, if you're running up uh, to the limit with normal shifters, then the rider should change to an electronic shifter. Uh, for the 10 centimeter rule, you can see that's also a problem when you have shifters that can uh, uh, that auto center upwards. Uh, or somewhere between uh, vertical and horizontal. So this sort of uh, situation. And once again, an electronic shifter saves you space. And you'll see a lot of the riders um, go to the absolute limit on this um, and try to get as much of an angle. And that's to get that aerodynamic position of the forearms in front of the head as far as possible. One way to do that is to buy an off the shelf uh, UCI uh, legal system where uh, this distance is exactly from the t vertical distance from the top of these to the center of these pads is exactly 10 centimeters and they set at an angle of 15 degrees but you can achieve a slightly greater uh, error position by moving this pad closer to these um, uh, extensions and then you can actually exceed that angle if the shape of these is not measurable as a 15 degree angle. But what it does do is that then you move the support position further and further up the arm and away from the elbow, and it can mean a loss of support. And that, that for that reason, you'll see quite a lot of the, um, uh, the custom-made uh, bars have actually got almost a cup-shaped surface all the way along to support the arm to give you as much support as possible. But these off-the-shelf ones are UCI legal and get you that angle that gives you that little bit more of an aerodynamic position. So that's really the UCI rules in a nutshell and how you need to stay within them. Um, and that brings us to the end of the talk. I think we've done uh, a full hour and a bit. So uh, that's probably the max attention span that can get out of anybody. So thank you all for listening. And obviously, uh, you can post questions and we can uh, answer some questions uh, for as long as everybody feels uh, that they've still got energy. I haven't seen any come up in the comments section yet. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've had a, a few questions coming in. Bianca's been ah. manning the chat box. So first of all, thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, yes, if anybody does want to put some further questions in the chat box, please do. Uh, bear in mind the slight delay in the feed from uh, what we're saying and, and you hearing it. So uh, we will sort of hang around just to see whether any questions come through. Um, there was one question that came through from the podium physio. Uh, I, I do apologize. We had a slight technical issue. You managed to block your question by mistake rather than saving it to put up on the screen. So apologies about that. 
So the, the question was around how do we manage hip uh, restrictions in terms of maybe femoral acetabular impingement or perhaps somebody who's got uh, arthritic changes that are starting to limit their hip mobility. So what are your thoughts on how we need to manage a position or uh, adapt a position to accommodate those kind of restrictions? Yeah. Um, Wendy, you were happy for me to answer that one? Yeah, go ahead. I'll add if I if I feel need to. Yeah, so this is something that we see often in the older athlete. If they've had, uh, particularly what we see a lot of these days is acetabular labral tears. And when that uh, labrum starts to get a little bit degenerative, it just uh, enlarges a little bit and you lose that ability to get into that deep hip flexion. Um, and, and, and so that's the earliest sort of point. And later on, if they start to develop a bit of osteoarthrosis, then you start losing more and more of that hip flexion range. Um, and then uh, people with FAI, so abnormal hip morphologies where they, where they have a limitation in hip flexion are obviously also limited. So we see this uh, quite frequently. And there are a couple of ways to get over that. If there's somebody who's relatively short stature, so we, what I was saying earlier on, uh, less than 180 centimeters, but typically less than 175 centimeters, then you can try and get that saddle as far forward. So use a really short saddle, the shortest that you're allowed. So go for one that's 240 mils um, and then try and get the, the measured setback to as little as possible. And that opens up the hip angle. Um, and obviously uh, uh, they can still be aero because you're effectively rotating them around the front of the, the bike. The other way that you can do that is by um, using a shorter crank arm. So with uh, time trialing, you're using a constant velocity for most time trials, unless it's a very technical course. And when you're at a constant velocity, you don't need the torque of a long crank arm as much as you do for road cycling or track or sprint or mountain biking. So you can go for a much shorter crank arm and still maintain um, good power outputs. And by shortening the, shortening the crank arm, you reduce the um, uh, hip flexion at top dead center position and uh, can overcome that uh, that difficulty with hip flexion. Yeah, and I can speak from a personal experience in that uh, my hips are not in their best state, should we say, uh, and I ride 162.5 cranks uh, on my time trial bike, and yes, in a very forward position, mm -hmm. and I've got 165 on my road bike. Um, but yes, yeah, definitely it's that, that shorter crank does make a big difference coming over the top of the pedal stroke. Um, Wendy, from the sort of physio's perspective, is there anything? Yeah, I mean, it just comes back to, to kind of that opening slide that I had of, of who your client is and what they want to achieve out of that bike fit. So you might not get them into an absolute aero position in terms of performance because you're going to possibly even lift them up so that they're not as low in the front to open up those hips. I mean, that might have to be an option. And, and it comes down to injury prevention and comfort over performance for that particular rider. Um, and then just giving them, them, you know, if it's arthritis that's coming in, you want them to, to keep riding because it's mobilizing that joint and keeping it at bay. So you don't want them to stop. So you want them to be in a comfortable position on the bike. Um, and by doing that, um, they keep riding. So that might be, as, as Jorana said, bringing the saddle forwards, lifting the shortening the cranks or even lifting the front of the body um, to open up those hips so that they're not closing them down. Yeah. Uh, Bianca, do you want to pop on any other questions here? I, I know um, James had a few questions regarding the pressure, saddle pressure measurements uh, as a, a proxy for effective position when tinkering and optimizing a position for aerodynamic perspective, and perhaps that's in the wind tunnel as well. Um, I don't know whether Bianca can put that question in text form up on the screen. Have we lost Bianca? We've possibly lost Bianca. It looks like we've um, lost her. It doesn't look like we've lost Remember her. the question, Tim? Uh, the question was regarding using um, pressure management oh, GB Myers <laughs> And do you use that for really sort of tinkering and optimizing that position in the wind tunnel? Yeah, you can. Um, so we, we know that when you start to do uh, fit, start to fiddle with the time trial position, 
you can often compromise the position and, and end up uh, having the, the individual compensate. So uh, we're talking about you know little things that we do in the wind tunnel, like changing the elbow um, a pad width. And we start to narrow down the elbow pads, and then you start to get a little bit of scapular protraction, and then that changes the torso position. And you can pick up on all those little changes on the saddle pressure mapping before you see them in any kinematic data otherwise. So it's a very useful uh, modality to, to really see the subtle changes uh, and, and how they affect uh, the, the stability and, and contact point on the saddle. So I think uh, in time trial fitting, if you're not using saddle pressure mapping, you're really losing out on a, on a, on a wealth of data. And uh, it really is a crucial aspect of, of our fitting process. Great stuff. I'm seeing lots of um, messages coming here just saying thank you, great points, really informative. Um, are there any other questions anybody wants to ask tonight? We'll sort of give it a, a little moment to see if anything comes through on the, the chat there. I tell you, a good question for you guys is, Wendy, where can we access lots of your research? Because you've got some fantastic papers that have come out as part of your thesis. Yeah, so um, that's Duran and I have published together, and they're in a number of medical journals. Um, I can send you a, a list of, of where all those publications are, um, which you can maybe put up. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll put links to uh, obviously your research, it's um, on research data or um, things to particular papers. As well as your own, where where would um, people where do you want people to try and find you? Are you, are um, you mostly on Twitter? Yeah, well, Twitter, they can find me Wens H uh, Physio, or even LinkedIn. Um, and there's some there's a link to all the references to all the papers on LinkedIn, and that's Wendy Holiday. And Wendy, your entire thesis is online. Um, if, you, if you Google yeah. Wendy Holiday. PhD, you'll find it the in the UCT archives uh, the PhD of the entire thesis. So, uh, for those of you who, who've got lots of time to to read, <laughs> download the whole thing. And let me know if somebody reads it. I'll be very impressed. <laughs> There's one last question that's just well, sort of a comment as such. Um, Nick has said no mention of crank length changes yet. Now, Nick, uh, I don't want to preempt Wendy and Jerome, but. Um, I'd say that probably needs a webinar of its own, to be fair, um, unless Wendy Strewn would like to succinctly um, throw some comments that way. Yeah, I think, that, like you say, it needs an entire webinar. Crank length is a um, subject that's, that's still, I think, way under research, and, and, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the existing research actually means. Um, mm. and. Uh, most people think shorter, go shorter, go shorter, but then uh, there hasn't been any research that's looked at um, the effectiveness of torque uh, at the crank and how that, that's impaired by short, excessively short cranks. So, uh, like you say, a, a whole webinar just on crank length would be useful. Yeah, yeah. I always say to clients, you know, if they're looking between a 170 and a 172.5, it's a 2.5 millimeter difference. Um, you know, unless we're looking at a 165 to a 175, that's a different story. Um, but yeah, the research isn't um, conclusive at this stage as to what is optimal for each individual person. And it, it's not something I'm gonna change straight away. It's not the first thing I'm gonna change on their bike. I think there's a lot of other um, options to change before we start changing crank length unless you know it's somebody who is incredibly short and their saddle is as low as they can go and they still can't reach the pedals because they've got 180 crank lengths on then i'll go and change the crank lengths but um for for such small changes um it's it's not the first thing i'm going to change right yeah we'll have to put a, a whole webinar on for for you nick but uh yeah that's it is a an, an absolute minefield. And I guess it depends on are we talking about crank length from a performance point of view, or are we talking about it with our, our physio or our medical hat on um, regarding sort of hip pathologies that we just talked about just before there. 
but uh, yeah, Nick, definitely we'll we'll get our thinking caps on and put a, a webinar together on on the whole minefield that is crank length, most definitely. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions coming through on the chat? I don't think so. That's covered everything so far, hasn't it? Obviously, if you come up with further questions later on, by all means, um, drop us a message on social media, so either on the Instagram, Twitter pages. Obviously, um, follow our speakers, and by all means, um, send messages that way if you want to find out any more, or pick up the, the research papers and, and have a good read. So, Bianca, is there anything else you want to, to add? Okay, so I'll just say thank you very much again for your time this evening and look forward to hopefully doing a bit more work with you guys in the future. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure being here.